that we are live. So hello everybody and welcome to our vampire panel in tandem with the Miami Book Fair. My name is Mallory Nelson. I am the blog director at the Parliament House Press and I am here with authors Winnie Lyon, Jason Tannemore, and Shane Layton to discuss vampires, all things vampires, and the vampires that appear in their books. So let's start out by just having you guys introduce yourselves. Um, Jason, let's start with you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Vampires of Portlandia? Hi, um, so Vampires of Portlandia, it's, it's basically based off Filipino folklore, Aswan, which uh, means shapeshifter. And uh, there's five breeds of Aswan and vampires are one of them. And I focus on them mainly because, uh, you know, my favorite movie is Lost Boys and uh, we kind of discussed offline earlier that I think everybody has a little bit, they want to be a vampire. So it kind of resonated with me a little bit. And uh, that's what the, the book is about. Awesome. Yeah. And I know that we've spoken about this before. Lost Boys, I think, is a cultural phenomenon that resonates with a ton of people. So that's super cool. Shane, how about you tell us a little bit about your series of Light and Darkness and then your upcoming book of Blood and Magic coming in December. Thank you. Yeah, my book is of light and darkness. It was originally published back in 2011, which seems like another lifetime ago, um, but it was republished in 2016. And now I'm coming out with book two finally this year. So it's been a very long process. Um, the book is basically a love letter to uh, my husband and um, our story and my personal love for Prague and the Czech Republic. I try to incorporate a lot of Slavic folklore, Slavic legends into uh, the story. And um, basically it is not from the point of view of the vampires um, from his perspective. It's it's more from the point of view of the normal, you know, girl's perspective. And um, it's basically about a girl who um, is the only non-magical being in a society of magical beings so she is essentially powerless but the series is about her finding her way and finding her power um, and finding her own kind of magic um, among everybody else who is so much more powerful than she is so the coming of age story I hate that but it, yeah it is <laughs> we all have to come of age <laughs> but that's awesome I, I especially love how you mentioned that it's from her perspective specifically um, so many of these vampire stories are about the vampires because we are fascinated by them. And I love that you used that as a counterpoint to tell her story. So thank you so much for sharing that. And Winnie, how about you tell us about The Curse of the King, which just came out in September as well. Yeah, um, so The Curse of the King is, the main character is actually a witch and she's descended from the witches who put a curse on Shakespeare's Macbeth and made it bad luck to say in the theater. And she decides to break the curse. And along the way, she becomes friends with Peter, who is a vampire, um, who's a very new vampire to the scene. And it's generally a tale about uh, being in high school and learning about who you are when you're young and what your legacy is and how you feel like you want to step your foot on the right foot in your future. And that's what the like who Peter is to me as a vampire. Awesome. Thank you so much, you guys, for sharing. And thank you so much for being with me here with me tonight and um, sharing your perspectives um, and your writing journey with everybody here in the Parlorverse. So let's just jump right in. Um, I'd want to start by asking you what all of your introduction to vampires were. What was the first thing that drew you in to the vampire milieu? Jason, let's start with you again. Uh, well, you know, it was the movie Lost Boys. It came out at that perfect time. I, I think it was about 11 or 12 years old. And it, not necessarily the vampires, but just the entire movie. And that's kind of the kind of a mash genre of, of horror and comedy into one. And I feel like that's my life. It's a horror and a comedy um, forever. And the movies, I, just like Beetlejuice and uh, Ghostbusters, those types of movies, I just, I love watching. And so that was kind of my introduction um, to it. And even today, I watched it, uh, the movie a couple months ago, and I still just had that same feel I had when I was 12 years old. It's just so silly, but it's great. <laughs> yeah, it really is. 
it, it, it prevails for sure. Shane, how about you? Saw- you? You have to love that, that eighties nostalgia for sure. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I am, uh, I was partially ashamed to say that my first introduction, uh, my first foray with vampires, if you will, was twilight um, because I was 15 when the books initially came out. So I was at the perfect age uh, to get into that world um, when it was, you know, flourishing. But um, my one of my favorite stories is I was on the train on the way to school, because I went to an art school, I rode a train. <laughs> and um, I like saying that. Um, and so I was talking to my friend, Amy, who was so much wiser beyond her years, so much more mature beyond her years than I was. And, so, you know, I knew she was into the dark stuff and I was telling her, oh my God, I found this novel, Twilight. It's amazing. You should check it out. You would love it. It's everything. And, you know, so of course she read it. Um, and in about a week, she came back to me and she goes, Shane, <laughs> she's like, let me introduce you to Anne Rice. Um, she's like, Twilight is applesauce, whereas interview with a vampire is like a fine Marlowe. And this is a 15 year old saying these exact words to me. I'll never forget it because I just thought it was hysterical. Um, and <laughs> and uh, so we had a sleepover pretty soon after that conversation had happened. And uh, we watched Interview with a Vampire. And my world was blown wide apart because I fell in love with Brad Pitt and, uh, and Louis. Um, not so much Lestat. I think there's two kinds of people in the world. You're either a Lestat person or a Louis person. And I am absolutely a Louis person, which shows up very prominently in my story. Um, and uh, and then I read the books after I had seen Interview with the Vampire, the movie. Um, and then I fell in love with Anne Rice as a writer and her prose. They were just so flowery and so beautiful. And I didn't care if they were too flowery because some people like to, you know, I I know that there are some readers that say that. Um, but I disagree. I mean, I just think it, she writes like poetry. So I aspired to to achieve something similar in my career as well. That's amazing. And she is a wonderful writer. And so are all of you. Um, But I also, I just have to interject because I do have an insane love for interview with the vampire. And I am definitely the Lestat person. So I'm the Lestat to your Louis. Um, um, I'm just, I'm just always sad. I think that's what (laughs) And I'm the person like, no, come on, come. Enjoy life with me. (laughs) Uh, so Winnie that leads me to you what was your introduction into vampires um I grew up watching Disney Channel shows and my favorite show was Wizards of Waverly Place and there's this like 10 episode arc where the wizard family meets a vampire family and I think that was my first like I figured out what a vampire was I must have been like seven when the show was airing um and then I was around eight or nine when the twilight movies started coming out and i had two older sisters who loved it and so i watched all the movies and fell really hard back into a twilight phase earlier this year so it never left me well that's good stephanie meyer is certainly a very prominent voice in vampire literature um so this leads me to my next question actually um how has this introduction influenced you and your writing or was it more of a gateway into a broader interest? And Winnie, I'll just keep with you for this question um, since you were just talking about Stephanie Meyer there. Yeah, I definitely think it did. It um, stuck with me in the way that I think Stephanie Meyer did something with vampires that hasn't hadn't been done before. Um, but I would say that it wasn't the first thing that made me want to create my own vampire fiction. That was um, a web series that I discovered in 2015 called Carmilla, which is a modern adaptation of the Joseph Lasano 1872 novella about vampires. Yeah, super, super classic literary representation. One of the first female representations of vampirism that was majorly influential yeah that's like that's a great entry point um jason let's take it to you how about you um to repeat the question uh, yo, go ahead, yeah. <laughs> has this introduction <laughs> continued to influence you or was it more of a gateway into a broader um, interest it wasn't necessarily it didn't really continue to influence it was more of a gateway um 
I, I never really thought you can combine genres like that. So, you know, it was, I mean, Scream took it to another level. It was just a funny movie that was creepy. And, and that was kind of what I took away from it. And that's what Vampires of Portlandia is. It's, it's kind of creepy, but there's some funny moments that, uh, you know, kind of balance that emotion out. Uh, so in terms of just uh, vampires, I'm not, you know, I like vampires. I think they're cool, but it was more the the entire film Lost Boys that really uh, got this book to where it was. It was just that whole emotional roller coaster of being creeped out, laughing, um, and doing it all over again. Awesome, yeah. And Shane, how about for you? Um, it, it definitely continued to be an inspiration. And in fact, I pay homage a little bit to Anne Rice within my series because there is a character, Francis, who in essence is like my version of Lestat and Volek, um, the main love interest is kind of my version of Louis. So um, he's heavily influenced by my own husband, but also her character as well. So um, I definitely took themes and pieces of her story and um, fixed them into mine just because they're brilliant. Um, but as far as the atmosphere goes, I think I deviated a little bit and I found inspiration in other places because um, I, I don't always love the atmosphere of a lot of vampire um, content or pop culture. I think sometimes it's a little bit too... Uh, I don't know what the word is, gosh, I don't know. Not, I mean, not always, um, but so my inspiration kind of deviated from the whole Anne Rice universe and instead switched over to like um, the atmosphere of Pan's Labyrinth, uh, which is more of like a dark fantasy. It talks a lot about war. Um, and so that's where the other facets of my story come into play because there's a lot more going on than just vampires. It's, you know, there's elves with different um, inclinations toward, you know, like factions of nature, and then there are werewolves, and there are all kinds of um, Slavic monsters, and so I, I really look to Guillermo del Toro for those visuals. I'm a very visual person, so I try to incorporate that into my writing and, and take those things and um, transpose them into something that's literary, so um, yeah, so I just, I try to fuse those two different things the the gothic amazingness of of you know the vampire worlds and then something that's a little bit more whimsical i guess and a little less gothic yeah that's awesome that's a a great visual i mean pan's labyrinth is so iconic i think that we can all just immediately visualize what it is that you're talking about when you when you say that um and that does uh bring me to the next question because you all do have very different aesthetic takes on vampires and as you all talked about how this incorpor is incorporated into your broader worlds um, and different elements that you've incorporated whether that be from folklore or um, from lived experience um, so Shane you do lean into that gothic and baroque style but as you said you have the pen's labyrinth Jason you have this like sort of underbelly of Portland meets the comedic 80s vibe from Lost Boys but you also incorporate that immigrant family dynamic um, that's very central to your story. And Winnie, your take is like these witches that have their very strong presence, but you also have like a much more whimsical and lighter approach, even in how you deal with um, your introduction of a vampire and that, that relationship between those characters. So with all of that being said, uh, how did you arrive at your aesthetic choices for these particular books? Um, Shane, why don't you take us away? <laughs> um, so I'll just say it again. And I, I actually, before I was ever involved in publishing or writing, my background was in film. I was pursuing film for a long time. So um, I combined the aesthetics of Let the Right One In um, which was the original European version of Let Me In, which I think is a far better film than the American version. So if anybody hasn't seen it, if you get the chance, check out the original version. You have to read subtitles, but it's absolutely worth it. So it's Let the Right One In, um, Pan's Labyrinth, pretty much anything from Guillermo del Toro that isn't Hellboy, <laughs> um, and Interview with a Vampire. I would say those, those three things create the ideal atmosphere for Light and Darkness. 
And what led you to like, was there like a specific moment that you knew uh, that these were like the aesthetics that you wanted? Was there, was there like an, like just, was, did it just hit you out of the blue or was it sort of an accumulative um, arriving to this understanding of what it was that you wanted to achieve with this aesthetic choice? It was very much a gradual thing and there was never one singular moment where I was like, aha, you know, this is yeah. it. I, I was, I started writing this book, um, actually, I think it was 16 when I started writing it and I had no idea. I still don't have any idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I really had no idea what I was doing. Um, and I had never been to Prague. So I, I think the first time I had watched Pan's Labyrinth, I was around that maybe a little, little bit older. Um, so, I mean, that was just such a brilliant film because there are, there are so many serious themes and serious issues, world issues that he's dealing with that are, um, they should always be current in literature. They should always be talked about in literature. So I mean, that's, that's not really your question. I'm just nerding out over here. Um, but no, I mean, I, I, it was essentially what I imagined, like the fantasy aspect of that film was what I imagined Prague to be before I had ever gone there and was like what I imagined Republic to be. Um, and I had met Frank when I was 16 and he was 10 years older than me. So we were just friends for a really long time, but I was always secretly infatuated with him and infatuated with his background. So like I would try to learn everything I could about the culture and about the place and, you know, looking up pictures online. And so it was really just my little imagination paired with, you know, Del Toro's visuals paired with stories that Frank would tell me. Um, so yeah, it just kind of gradually became the atmosphere, I guess. That's Putting awesome. the pieces together. <laughs> I, yeah, and it's really nice because it's not just, I like, it's nice that you shared this with us. Thank you for sharing because it's not just these like film influences and literary influence. It's deeply personal to you. Yeah, um, this, very, this series is, I don't think I'll ever write another series that is as emotionally personal to me as this one is. So protective. Yeah. So you've heard it folks. If you want the dirt read the books. Um, <laughs> Winnie, let's go to you. Since your aesthetics are quite different from both uh, Jason's and Shane's, how did you arrive at like this, knowing that this is what you wanted to do with your vampire character? Um, I think in general, the sort of whimsical fun aspect of The Curse of the King was motivated by reading a lot of YA and reading a lot of teenage characters that didn't feel like teenagers um, who would give these like very eloquent soliloquies and these this world-wise kind of sense that I don't think a lot of people have figured out and I love reading that but I wanted to have the sort of contrast of a, a vampire character that didn't have it all figured out yet because he's so young um, that was very heavily influenced by um Literature-wise, I really love Rainbow Rowell's writing, her Carry On series. Um, so Isabel Sterling's These Witches Don't Burn are these like young characters that feel fun and young, but also have the grand magical element of it all. Um, and on screen, I really love um, Winona Earp, which is an adaptation of a comic, but is this like hilarious, but really high supernatural uh, element show that I... I love the aesthetic of, and I think those were the biggest influences in me deciding to make it this sort of more upbeat handling of like the macabre that can come with like vampires. That's awesome. I also love Winona. So shout out to all your herbers out <laughs> there. <laughs> and Jason, how about for you? Oh, uh, yeah, I wasn't, I didn't set out to write a vampire story uh portland if you've ever been here it's it's kind of reminds me of the lost boys it's uh, there's two sides of portland there's portlandia the show very quirky and unusual and then there's a grim just you know sometimes you scared i mean look what's going on we have brides every freaking day but when i was working downtown when i was still going to work uh one of the things that portland is known for in the fall is the thousands and thousands of crows roost in downtown it's just the setting is perfect for these crows and and there's sometimes up to 20,000 crows and one of the Aswan breeds is a weird beast and they shapeshift two crows or dogs 
And it just started to make a little bit more sense. And originally, I wanted to call it Aswams of Portlandia, but I didn't think it was a universal term. So I started to focus on one of the breeds, which was vampires. Well, when I was trying to figure out where they should be coming from in the Philippines, there's these hanging coffins that are just hang off the side of the mountains. And just if you ever Google it, it's very creepy, but it's beautiful nonetheless. So that was kind of the main reason why I focused on it. But uh, again, just going back to Lost Boys, I think vampires of all the monsters we can, you know, come up with are the, you know, they're like, they're the ones that everybody wants, are fascinated with. Um, you know, if I had to be one, it would be a vampire. So it was just kind of made sense. The The city itself has that combination of quirkiness, creepiness, and it just set up the atmosphere perfectly for this book. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so I think that this next question I will actually give to you again, Jason, just because I think that you've touched on it just a little bit then uh, in talking about how this your inspiration for the vampires in your story really comes from Filipino culture. Um, so the vampires and vampire creatures do appear in folklore across the across the world in many, many different cultures um, and from across many different times. So having that specific vampire vampiric tradition that you drew from and writing your novel, since you've already sort of answered that, I'm going to expand that question for you a little bit and ask um, what, what drew you to wanting to incorporate that specific aspect of Filipino culture in your writing or in that folklore? <laughs> I mean, the folk, I, so I was born in the States. I'd never been to the Philippines. And for all purposes, I'm a white kid with brown skin. And uh, so I, I never even heard of the term Aswang until I was watching Grimm, which was filmed and based in Portland. And uh, one of the episodes revolved around Sergeant Wu, who saw an Aswang. And I remember calling my dad and asking him about it. And he was just like, yeah, it's just a story your grandma told to scare you. So I started researching a little bit. And just if you kind of research, they're just depicted as just this like boogeyman of the Philippines. Well, I wanted to just kind of take a different take on it because, you know, for me, when I look at Lost Boys, they were, yeah, they were monsters, but it, they wanted to just be a part of this kind of culture at this fair in, you know, in California. And so I wanted to have these vampires be kind of relatable. Uh, the main theme of the story is, is this, or is it really an immigrant family just, coming from the Philippines to Portland to live in peace. They just happen to be vampires. Uh, so my goal was to just introduce Aswang on a kind of a base level to the United States. And really, I hope that you'll see a lot more renditions or versions of, of Aswang from uh, other Filipino writers. Um, you know, I, I, one of my favorite writers, Chuck Paul, and I grew up Fight Club, who's from the Portland area. And I took a writing class with him, and one of his goal was to, you know, let's turn readers into writers. And that's kind of what I want to do. You know, everybody has a story within them. It's just how are you going to get it out? You know, you, sometimes you just need a little push. Yeah. And I love that piece. I love that you want this to inspire other Filipino authors to write more about a culture that arguably needs more representation in the literary world. Um, Shane, how about we move to you? Same question. Um, do you draw on any particular folkloric traditions in your vampires? Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely not as much as Jason does. I, I think, um, you know, because of your background, Jason, you just have a lot more to pull from. I was, you know, just picking Frank's brain for a long time, <laughs> just asking him a bunch of questions because I was like, okay, enough. Um, but uh, yeah, so in the Czech Republic, they're called Upir, which I maybe referenced twice in the whole book. Otherwise, they're just vampires. Um, but I try to keep to, you know, the classic Slavic folklore, which is pretty similar to, you know, any reference of Dracula, which is they can't um, go out in the sunlight or else they, uh, you know turn into dust, basically, um, they are very much undead and there's really not too much deviation from like the classic vampire. Um, I think the only thing that's different in my folklore that's not necessarily a Slavic thing, but just a shame thing is that um, during the daylight hours, they don't just go to sleep or hide in a coffin. They physically 
become corpses again and they decompose and they turn into like this frail, uh, brittle, you know, the skin turns into like this paper thin and they look like corpses that have been dead for like over a hundred years. So there's a, not to give away too many spoilers or anything, but there's a scene where Charlotte, the main character, um, you know, comes into the room during the daylight hours, which she's not supposed to do. And Bollock's laying there in his like corpse state. And she has a, <laughs> an emotional like meltdown because she's seeing that for the first time. And so I think that's, that's the only bit of like folklore that I maybe twist and, and try to, because sci- scientifically that made sense to me at the time. So I do love that though. It does create a really horrific image, especially when related to a romantic love relationship <laughs> like that would be a traumatizing experience be shocking <laughs> yeah, like, right. you would have to grapple with some feelings with, with that one <laughs> and boy does she <laughs> among other things so, for sure. <laughs> all right so Winnie how about for you did you pull on any um folkloric traditions or um do any research in that area when creating your vampire I generally talk to a good amount of the classic like you would imagine um there's some back and forth between laura and peter where she asks like can you um does a wooden stake kill you and he's like yeah and i have a healthy fear of fire too and they the general he can't see himself in mirrors type of um what you expect from like a very textbook vampire i think i mostly just changed that sunlight is not an issue for a vampire if they're hydrated they're well fed, they can go outside and they're all right. Um, and then I, what I did wasn't changing the elements of the vampire necessarily, but kind of modernizing them or bringing up modern questions that like I hadn't even thought about until I was writing it, which is, can a vampire use facial ID recognition mm-hmm. if they can't see themselves in a mirror or in the modern day, his Instagram must be terrible because he can't show up on camera. Um, and so not changing it but bringing in a more modern twist and having my main character be a witch was another interesting thing where it in the magic system that I sort of created with the curse of the king seeing what boundaries I could push with within the realist realistic lines of what Laura's magic could do to him that's awesome I I think that that's interesting that you brought that up because you are your main character is a witch and not a vampire and so how you played with that system how magic would impact him differently is what I'm here hearing you're saying is that correct Mm. awesome so that's thank you so much for sharing so we've talked a bit about folklore and then also the literary importance of vampires um so I want to get a little bit back into that um vampires as you mentioned Winnie have been sort of a cultural phenomenon since Dracula We've never looked back. Um, it it take, takes the world by storm. So um, with that, there is a lot of literary symbolism that comes with vampires. Um, does vampiricism in your stories have any symbolic meaning in your work beyond just a mechanism for feeding or horror or for just existing? So... Who would like to take that question? I know that one's a bit of a meteor question, so we can have a minute to think about it if we need to and just jump in when, whenever you're ready. I mean, I, I think I can take this first because like I said before, of light and darkness is such a personal story for me. Um, I'm trying to remember, like I, when I first started writing the book, it actually wasn't with Frank in mind. What I had started out doing, I, and I wasn't writing of light and darkness per se, but I was just trying my hand at writing a fantasy. And so the whole big idea was to um, take people who were real in my life and to put them in a fan, in a fantasy setting. And if they existed in a fantasy setting, what kind of monster would they be, you know, based on their personality and what they looked like, like what kind of monster would they be? So like Mr. Trinochka's is my grandfather because he's a, he's a giant spider with so many hands but my grandfather was never monstrous he um was just he, involved in so many things and he was always around and he was always available and he was always you know uh just present so i think that's you know um so to answer your question though um like when i when i did start 
incorporating vampires. When I did start incorporating Frank, I think the idea was that um, because he was so much older than me and because he was from a different country, he spoke a different language. When I met him, he didn't speak English as well as he does now, obviously, or else we would have a huge problem. Um, he, uh, he was just so enigmatic um, and beautiful and way out of my league. So I, um, that, that was, I just had, had associated him with um, like a godlike immortal which in my mind was a vampire. So I think that is the representation. It's just eternal beauty um, is like the ultimate partner, like the ideal partner, somebody who could never get old, somebody who could, um, yeah, I mean, that's it. <laughs> Basically, you could never, never really change, uh, who was always a mystery, you know, who had a dark, dark element. So, um, you know, that was, who had this like air of, sexiness that kind of thing and I, I think that's what they represent in my book and now it's it's all of the characters that are vampires represent that kind of thing because they're all beautiful so yeah for sure there is that that nature of otherness that comes with vampires that does lend itself very well to that sense of unattainability that you describe and so I love that again, that it's so deeply personal to you, but at, that you've utilized it as a device more broadly. That's super cool. Um, Jason, let's go to you for that same question. Um, does vampiricism take on any symbolic meaning in your in your work? Uh, not, not really. I mean, outside of physical characteristics, uh, you know, one of the main themes is them just trying to stay under the radar and just be normal people. And really that normalness and the kids, grandkids growing up thinking that they're the only types of Aswangs out there uh, really gets them in trouble. And that's what triggers the, the action in the book. So uh, outside and the, you know, the flying and fangs and, and stuff like that, they, they have jobs, they go out in public, they eat regular food, they have uh, differences with their siblings and each other, and they communicate with everyone else. But Outside of that, there really isn't uh, any symbolism other than they're just, you know, like vampires. They kind of just don't, they just want to be there. You know, they're not really flashy. They just are there and trying to maintain this identity from the normal people until they realize they're, oh, we're not the only breed. So, yeah. Would you say that then the symbolism is actually not so much that of vampires, but that of utilizing vampires as a representation of the struggles that immigrant families face? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, like you're utilizing absolutely. that as a sort of symbol in and of itself. Right, right. Um, you know, they, he's coming from someone who grew up in the States and speaks pretty well English. I mean, I was the same way. I, I'm not gonna, you know, I really, I went to a private school, which is primarily white. Uh, so I tried to assimilate as much as possible. I wasn't going to do any craziness to draw more attention to it. Um, you know, especially as a kid growing up in the eighties, uh, we didn't have social media back then. I mean, if you wanted to get in a fight that you knew who was going to kick your ass, it wasn't a, a, you know, an anonymous message on Facebook or whatever it was. It was, uh, oh, this guy's in my face, I better. So I try to blend in, and, and that's what the family is, is they, you know, they don't want to draw their attention. They're already in this new country. Yeah, for and sure. for the yeah. most part, it served, served them well. Awesome. And Winnie, how about for you? Was there any symbolism that you drew, you added into your story? Yeah, I would say so. Um, Peter's character and his, if Peter could not exist in this book the way that he does without being a vampire um because his whole character conflict has to do with his life is now frozen and he's 18 and doesn't know what to do i named him peter after peter pan because he'll never grow up and that was like something i was obsessed with as a kid and i loved peter pan um and i wanted to sort of bring that into the idea of this like imagine if your whole world stopped when you were a high school senior and I wrote this, I like started drafting this um, my first semester of college and couldn't imagine if my life were to freeze at that moment. And I put that into him and his vampirism is sort of me, I guess when I was writing it, sort of expressing that transition period in my life that I was in and using him and 
who he is as a vampire and just as a character to express the way that I look at um, how we treat being young and how people feel like if you don't get everything you ever want to do done in high school, you're stuck forever. Yeah, that's um, awesome. I like that is actually like a really heavy thing to incorporate and you did it so well in like this light way. But like, you. I, I appreciate that all of you have this really deeply personal tie <laughs> to how you have illustrated your vampires in these stories. They're, it's like, I feel like you have just given us a window into your lives. So I thank you so much for sharing that with all of us. So I'm going to move on to this question, although I don't know that, Jason, this is going to be applicable to you. So I actually will start with you for this um, because I do think it will be interesting anyway, um, because specifically blood is very involved in vampires um, and the role of blood and how vampires are portrayed and what that can mean in the story is very important to each individual story. But as you said, that that's not really a central aspect of your vampires and they eat normal food and they live normal lives. So how does the lack of that element play out in your story? I, I mean, it, it really doesn't. Uh, I, I was going to kind of joke about this a little bit, but there's a Filipino dish that's primarily pig guts called dinaguan and nobody eats it. <laughs> um, I can con my uh, white friends into eating it if they come over, but it basically just looks like pig guts and blood. So that was going to be my tie into blood because Filipinos love it. Uh, this one doesn't, but uh, <laughs> Filipinos love it. So um, otherwise, uh, you know, again, they're vampires, but they're they're basically people just trying to blend in. Um, so I, you're right; it didn't really have <laughs> a lot of relevance, but I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> I do love that you made a joke out of it, though. I mean, if your if your vampires aren't going to eat blood, you might as well make your non vampires right. eat pig blood. Yeah, right. eat, eat blood. <laughs> so, Shane, how about for you? Does the role of blood or blood consumption how does that play out in your story? So it play. I mean, it's a huge part in book one um, because that's just like an Anne Rice or Dracula or whatever, that's how they live and breathe and go on about their undead existences. Um, but uh, there's specifically a part in book two towards the end where uh, Volick and Charlotte are having a heart to heart. And, you know, she's just, um, I guess, just trying to understand where he's coming from after a, a tough time. Uh, and, you know, he's trying to explain to her that it, it's not just, food it's not just sustenance that it is representative of every single you know pleasurable thing that we experience in life as people so there there's a part that he actually says you know when I think he's talking like when I died all of those pleasurable things um left me so you know food sex life and anything that brought me any amount of joy was gone because that is the price to pay for immortality and for living forever you're supposed to suffer you know you're cursed by the devil so you're supposed to suffer like there's a lot of um in book two there's a lot of heavy religious themes that are discussed like catholic themes and things like that and so he hates himself <laughs> like Louis um and so he's having this conversation and so blood is basically the only thing that brings any amount of that back and that's why um the vampires in my book are so transfixed by it is because it is you know like Edward says it's it's more it's a drug it's but it's more than that it's so it's so much more heightened than that and it has to be I think for the stakes to remain high you know it can't just be a thing where you can say you know, okay, no, I don't, I don't need this or no, I don't need to drink from people. Um, because, you know, that was a thing that Stephanie Meyer did differently. And I appreciated that because, you know, she, she just did something different and it was a cool thing to explore. Like, could there be vegan vampires, you know? Um, but I think in my situation, I, I like when the stakes are high. I like when things feel a little bit too dangerous. Um, so I wanted to, to maintain that and make sure there was really no way out for him. Um, so you know, the only form of pleasure he could continue to achieve from his type of life is actually still a punishment because he doesn't really like doing it and certainly not 
to Charlotte. Um, so, yeah. It's interesting because the way you describe it sort of creates like an implicit reversal of a power dynamic because the vampire has a ton of control and power against a mortal person who they feed on, but because they are so chained by their need for this, it sort of creates a, a reversal in that power dynamic. There's an interplay there that's really interesting to me. Absolutely. Um, and then, you know, again, not to give away too many things, but um, so in book three, which I'm starting to write right now, um, I'm exploring more so like the like the older vampires and like their history and how they came about. And, um, you know, the the leader of that facet of things, um, which people will mean book two, uh, he talks about, you know, not killing off humans or you know slaughtering thousands or millions of people he talks about preserving them and almost worshiping them like egyptian cats um, because yeah they are extremely dependent <laughs> so um yeah so it raises the stakes it also keeps things very dark well i'm so excited for both book two and book three to come out then um, Winnie, how about for you? Like, how does blood, I know that you mentioned that there's this new element sort of and how you have approached how drinking blood or being well hydrated uh, can allow vampires to exist in the sun. So how else have you incorporated um, that particular element and what kind of meaning does it hold for your character? Um, that was another element that I decided to sort of into modernity which is um not i don't think i'm the first person to do this method of getting blood but peter uh volunteers at a hospital and steals blood bags from the hospital and that's just how he feeds and that's the only way he does it he doesn't want to hurt people but he still does drink human blood um, and uh i've read in a lot of vampire fiction the idea of like smelling blood is tempting to different vampires um, and I've put Peter and the vampires in The Curse of the King to the standard of, like, vampires don't need to breathe, so that's not an issue for him, but he can hear everyone's heartbeat at all times, and that's where he gets the idea, like, that's where he struggles with it. Um, blood as a whole doesn't necessarily provide a deeper meaning for him or for his character arc at all, but it does contribute to his feeling of otherness. He spends basically all of his time in the novel with Laura and their friend Holly um and he like cooks for them he makes them like pancakes in the morning and just like sits in the corner with like a coffee cup of blood and doesn't want to drink it in front of them because he feels other because of that uh so other than contributing to his feeling of being sort of an outcast it doesn't necessarily have this like a, a super deep meaning behind it it was just more an opportunity for me to explore how like a high school kid gets his hands on enough blood to sustain a vampire yeah, for sure. I do think that living in your own personal telltale heart, heart for all eternity sounds very horrific, though. <laughs> so that's its own special kind of hell. Um, so yeah, let's move on from that. Um, so as you mentioned, Winnie, vampires are outsiders, and your vampire is an outsider, and that's how, he, that how you have expressed his feelings in that way. Um, they can't live within the confines of normal society, or at least in the way that we would move through this world. So each of your books have completely different settings. And so I'm, I'm curious about what position vampires hold within the society as a whole. Um, you've talked about what, how they exist within their own little communities. But um, for instance, Winnie, with your vampire character, how does he move through the world that they live in? Is he viewed as being other by everyone else? Are, is he an accepted part of society? How does that function? Um, he walks this really weird line where before he became a vampire, he was like the star theater kid of their high school and people in their little world know who he is because he's like the cute boy who does the plays. And now he's not that. And he's suddenly like, I think... The beginning of the novel, Laura refers to him as like weird Peter Greenwood, 
because he's just like quiet and she's like why does my friend have a crush on this boy um so he is completely readjusted in his position in the world as just a person to people who don't know who he is or like what he is but even within the community of vampires in this universe peter's not an average vampire they tend to live in groups and they tend to kind of herd together and it's his turning the way that he became a vampire it was a situation that doesn't tend to happen a lot so he is feeling just so out of place in in multiple different ways and doesn't know if anyone else who exists in the magic universe uh until he meets Laura a full year after he's turned so he really learns to cope with his out- outsiderness that's word, um throughout the course of it yeah, it's interesting that you've it utilized the symbol of outsider for humans as well as outsider with vampires. So he's experiencing that from both sides. You can't catch it right. Yeah, for sure. It's hard <laughs> life for this kid. <laughs> and so, Jason, how about for you? How- uh, you know, they're they're forced to assimilate. One of the reasons why they left the Philippines was because they're being hunted. So their main priority was to just kind of be under the radar and fit in. Um, again, that that being uh, the matriarch doesn't chooses not to kind of explain all the other breeds uh, for reasons um, in the book. And so that not knowing of the other breeds, that ignorance uh, and being naive to that is is how they end up in the trouble they are. So it's one of those things where you think you're doing something right for your kids or whatever ends up not being the right thing. And, you know, I have my kid just got married and I'm sure I could have done a lot of things better, but you do the best you can at that time. And so that was kind of the reason behind this was, uh, you know, if they're going to migrate from another country because they're being hunted, it wouldn't make sense for them to to try to, you know, hey, look at me. Here I am. So. They, it was more important for them to to stay under the radar. Yeah, but as you mentioned, that it's interesting that that disconnection from the cultural heritage that would have informed their experiences with these other groups of Aswangs uh, was missing. And so it was sort of an expl. Would you say that it was sort of an exploration of how that could be a part of an immigrant experience as well? Um, possibly. Just, just sort of a, a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, possibly, I guess. That's a good point. Um, I have to think about that one. Okay, we'll just leave it with that then. Yeah, we'll um, agree with that. So, Shane, I know that you have this sort of like, I don't want to say it's it's sort of Alice in Wonderland-esque uh, mirror world sort of concept. And as you uh, talked previously about you have uh, drawn a lot from like Pan's Labyrinth and there's a lot of these surrealist elements um, to your story. So how do vampires fit into the structure of this world that is very unlike our own currently? Um, I think when upon initially reading the book, I, I think some readers get confused and think that it's a mirror world when it's actually not. It I liken it to um like similar world building to harry potter in the sense that they exist alongside us in our reality but just unbeknownst to us Mm -hmm. so um like their societies they live in places called occult cities which they could be small villages that are hidden in the middle of like the bohemian foothills um and it's guarded by spells and stuff where humans could you know unknowingly walk past the borders and not know what they just walked past. Maybe a spell would turn them away and they would never remember what they saw or something like that. Um, So it it exists in our reality. And and so vampires exist in our reality as well. Um, And, uh, but their governments are different and the society is different because just like in Harry Potter, you know, she's got her wizarding world. I've got my, magic, <laughs> you know, uh, occult society or whatever. So um, it you've got two warring fashions. It's that age old uh, trope, light versus dark, except, um, you know, so, so if you're living from the perspective of somebody who is a part of that society, you would, you would think that the dark side, um, that they are the villains, 
and that the vampires would be the villains. You would see them as bad. And so the elves and uh, all of the different magical beings that are part of the, the light factions of magic, they, they see them as villains. Um, but from the vampire's perspective, they're not. They're they're just trying to do their best. And yeah, do they have to do horrible things? Um, yes, but uh, it's it's definitely a gray area. So um, you know, so so there's a lot of prejudice in my book. Um, that and that's definitely a metaphor. Um, and also, so in the first book, there is the beginnings of a war, and the war is something that will span the entire series um where essentially it's the light side which is ruled by wizards there which are elder elves essentially um they uh they you know vampires are like social pariah and it's a full-out genocide they're just trying to kill all of them and rid the world of them because they're a nuisance in their eyes so they're just, they just don't belong um so yeah no nobody really likes the the dark side or the vampire side uh, unless you're charlotte <laughs> so, she's just her. drawn right in um, yeah so uh so yeah it, it's it's definitely um, exploring you know playing with those role reversals and, and playing with um you know is is there good and evil or is there is it everyone's just a big gray area which um jury's out on that one but uh Yes, but moral ambiguity is always the most interesting type of storytelling. All right, let's move into a little bit of a lighter question. I've like tried to nitpick your pick your brains for the nitty gritty granular stuff. So let's just move right into what your favorite element to write in the story was. Um, and Jason, how about we start with you for that one? Uh, mine was just incorporating the little nuances of the city of Portland. Um, you know, there's Shanghai tunnels that go underground. Uh, there's a submarine that was donated from the Navy just sitting in the river. Um, there's air, an air tram. There's a naked bike ride. Um, you know, there's a mask, vampire masquerade ball. It's just weird. And so I wanted to kind of incorporate a lot of that and serve as almost like a little Portland tour guide of the city as well. Um, especially with Percival, who is a uh, rickshaw driver, delivers the food, which they are totally driving, riding up and down the streets. So it was just uh, being able to kind of immortalize those little things in this little story it was fun. Yeah, and also just for those that don't know, Jason actually wrote a blog post that is a travel log of Portland through the eyes of the book, Vampires of Portlandia, if any of you want to check that out. Um, and get some more of his perspective on that. Um, and Shane, how about we move to you next? What was your favorite element to write in the in your books? I will answer your question, but I just wanted to say, Jason, that was a brilliant idea for your blog. And I also wanted to compliment Winnie because on uh, TikTok, she did something where she um, gave away um, annotated versions of her paperback and I was like that is such a good idea I love I love that I hope people took advantage of that because I, I just I wanted to send you an email I never did I just thought it was awesome um <laughs> uh my favorite element to write these um I mean I love exploring like the Slavic monsters and things that people didn't I, I think you know mainstream readers didn't really know about so much uh like in book two there's like a vodnik which is a uh, like a swamp monster uh and there's I mean there are some other things like that I don't know I didn't really have a favorite element I um really like writing the deep dramatic dark um Di like dialogue heavy scenes where characters are fighting and absolutely miserable that's my favorite part <laughs> i'm not so good at like the action scenes and you know when they're like physically fighting I, I um i strive to be better at that but uh yeah when somebody's fighting and crying and screaming at the other character i, I think that's <laughs> for some reason it's cathartic so i don't know <laughs> but i'm actually gonna have to jump off a little early uh have a great panel, guys. I I, just, I have to go because I'm actually going home from where I am now. So uh, thank you so much for having me, though, Mallory. This was awesome. And uh, good luck, guys, for the rest of the panel. And I'll see you soon. Yep, thanks for joining us. Bye. Hey, Shane. <laughs> All right. So Winnie, we'll go to that question for you. What was your favorite element that 
you incorporated into your book what was your favorite element to write um my favorite element was definitely the humor I had so much fun with the like dialogue back and forth between the main three characters and I feel like I'm sort of broken record saying that I wanted them to feel like actual teenagers and make fun of each other and make jokes the way that a lot of teenagers cope with stressful situations or anyone does really but in the the way that I know that I do with my friends and people I know and I liked creating the sort of this huge magical crisis is happening and we need to just deal with it so we're gonna call each other dumb nicknames until we feel better and Laura and Peter have this back and forth throughout the entire novel where they come up with the most increasingly ridiculous nicknames to make fun of one another's magical afflictions and Holly has to kind of stand in between them and stop them from bickering but it's all in good fun and uh she's the main narrator she's not a vampire but Laura her commentary seeing the plot of the story through her eyes was so much fun to write and her sort of quips in her own internal monologue and times she makes herself laugh um I had like the most fun I've ever had writing a book with this that's super awesome and I like I like that we're getting a perspective of like a young adult book and characters that are in this world from a person so who is so young like I think that that's important like I think it's important that there is representation for voices of your age group and that you're stepping up and actually fill, filling that role is something that I'm very enthusiastic about thank you yeah so I think that with that we are pushing well past our 45 minute goal thank you so much for talking so at length with me about this I think that there are a couple of questions for you guys in the chat from our viewers if you guys have a few more minutes to answer some of those so I know that there's one from Amanda. This is for Jason. Not really a question, but I was watching Paranormal caught on camera and they caught an Aswang shapeshifting and I geeked out because I knew the, what the creature was because of your book. So that's really awesome. That cool. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions that they would like to ask our authors? I'm gonna scroll up through here and see. I think that Erica said, asked, did you draw from any existing vampire lore? Or did you create your own? And I think we covered that question already. So hopefully, Erica, you got to hear the answer to that question. Um, Cindy has a question. Do vampire clans play a role in your novels? If so, is there a strict hierarchy? Is it family-based, fear-based, or combination? So we'll start with you, Jason, because we have a really clear understanding of that one for you. Like um, you have a, you yeah, just have such a, a... Yeah, there is a role. Um, I mean, I, as part of the Aswang lore, which I created was the first Aswang would rule over the whole, all the breeds. And that was Teniente Gimo. And uh, and the one of the reasons why Arturo, who is rules the second uh, oldest breed, if he can take out the vampires, that would promote his breed to be the top and that's kind of the conflict um so the clan is only as they know as the grandkids know only the four kids and their matriarch and then when she dies it's just them four they have no idea that there's anything else out there yeah and so Winnie how about for you do vampire clans play a role in your story Yes, they definitely exist in the universe of the Curse of the King. Um, and Peter was turned by a member of a vampire clan that doesn't belong to one. Um, it takes place in like small town Michigan and there's a clan in like Detroit that he was turned by someone in. Um, but I am continuing with the Curse of the King universe in a new separate duology that is also um, I'm working with the Parliament House with. Uh, called The Gods We Knew, and it is a big part of that upcoming novel. Awesome. So if you're interested in vampires and you like Winnie's books, stay tuned for okay. those books. <laughs> awesome. So we have another question. Uh, Mike asked if, for, I think this is for Jason primarily, if 
you would choose to be a vampire or an aswan? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I guess I'm Filipino, so it'd probably be, it would probably be an aswan, right? Um, no, I, I mean, I would probably be a, a, a vampire traditionally because I think one of the appeals is not growing old and kind of having this immortality. And the aswans, they can die. Uh, so they are essentially human, but vampires. So if you're going to be a vampire, you might as well be a vampire. For sure. How about you, Winnie? I mean, you didn't write about Aswangs, but would you prefer <laughs> to be a vampire or an Aswang? I mean, I guess I would like to be a vampire, mostly because anyone who knows me in real life really follows me on the internet at all, understands that I am such an avid vampire fan that I think if I said anything else, I would be betraying my own personal brand. You're branded. I I you can't. I don't know how I feel about living forever, though. That's a whole. That's a deeper conversation. I mean, it is a deeper conversation, but I feel like one that is worth having. I think Especially it'd be interesting to see history and different things. And and being my age, I feel like I'm. I. I was born in the right time because I was born pre-internet and post-internet. They're two different worlds. And so I think that appeal to see what is post post internet or you know are we even going to be communicating in person anymore and stuff like that I think that'd be interesting for me. For sure. Also with vampires, is it true immortality when you can die? So you could choose the moment of your own death if you wanted yeah. to. So it's I true. think immortal and unkillable. Yeah, it would be way worse. <laughs> Because then, yes, like you're staring down the heat death of the universe, and what do you do? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, That's a little bit in the Curse of the King, where they're having this argument about different magical species that exist, and Laura makes fun of Peter because he can be killed, but I think I think it's mermaids or elves that can't be killed. And she's like, "You're not really immortal." <laughs> Rude. But funny. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, that's what Amanda asked. Would Winnie choose to be a vampire and why? I hope that answered your question, Amanda. Um, Michael chimed in and said he'd be a werewolf, but this is not a werewolf panel, so <laughs> you can go be a werewolf. <laughs> all right, so I feel like that is all of the questions that we've had with the audience members. Thank you so much, everybody who watched and for contributing with your questions. Thank you so much, Jason. And thank you so much, Winnie, for joining me in this chat. And thank you to Shane, even though she's not here at the end. Thank you so much for joining us and having this conversation. I just want to run through your books one more time so people know to pick them up. Jason Tanamore wrote Vampires of Portlandia that came out September 29th, 2020. Winnie wrote The Curse of the King that came out September 1st in 2020. Of Light and Darkness, as Shane said, came out first in 2011, but her sequel is coming out December 8th, 2020, and it's called Of Blood and Magic. Thank you so much again, you guys, for joining me. Thank you. Have Thank a great you. rest of your night. <laughs>